So it's, this panel is for everyone who is not sure where he is right now. It's about protecting net neutrality in a polarized world. And it will be, uh, in a way, like all the other panels, um, uh, it will run for about an hour, and we will start with our three guests. Uh, and they will have the chance to introduce themselves and the topic and uh, their issues for about 10 minutes each. And then you can ask questions until the hour is up. And hopefully we will have a lot of fun and it will be very interesting. Okay, so I start uh, with Jacob Dexter from Forest, and he might say a few words to himself first and, and then introduce the topic and every one else, like Thomas Loninger and Caroline de Cook, um, will do the same afterwards. Jacob, you've got the microphone. All right, thank you very much. My name is Jacob Dexter. I am a deputy research or deputy program director for Forest Think Tank's program on digital rights and freedoms. Uh, Forest is a green and liberal think tank in Sweden, uh, and um, We've been working a lot with internet governance issues, uh, privacy, uh, and copyright. I am also a political scientist, uh, and I am going to put on that hat to begin with, um, speaking about what my master's thesis is about, among other things. So I'm going to be fairly brief. Um, net neutrality is a very, very attractive idea and concept. Perhaps deceptively so. I'm saying that I'm not saying that the principle is wrong per se, but it's too easy. And before you people rush at me with pitchforks and torches, I'm going to explain myself a bit. First of all, uh, when it comes to regulation, there is no such thing as a neutral net regulation. You must enforce something to keep the internet operators from developing a business model based on prioritization. Net neutrality is perhaps neutral from a bunch of different perspectives. An internet where end users have unhindered access to full, non-prioritized internet may be neutral from an end user perspective. An internet where internet operators can sell the service of prioritization to cover costs related to large packet volumes may be neutral from a market perspective. And an internet where internet operators may pay license, have license fees paid or users uh, have their traffic monitored to get to file sharing may be neutral from a licenses perspective for the copyright industry. So according to me, net neutrality is not a specific thing. It is pers a perspective on net regulation. Another problem I have with the usual net neutrality stance is the focus on certain parts of the technology associated with the internet. For the technologically savvy people in this room, I might sound like a kindergartner, but bear with me. Uh, the PTS, the Swedish Regulatory Agency for Net Neutrality Issues, uh, or Internet Issues, um, defines a value chain for the internet, meaning different layers where value is added to different products related to the internet. There are five different levels, the natural resources, the infrastructure, the transmissions, the IP, and the service and content level. Net neutrality as we know it is the concept of making sure that ISPs, internet service providers, on the IP level may not make any judgment on what exists on the service and content level. However, on other, other levels, there are far worse market failures uh, than on the IP level and what we discuss when we talk about net neutrality. Our internet is the sum of excavations, wires, transmitters, routers, and whatnot. So bearing that in mind, yes, regulation from an end user perspective might be a good thing. If you want to promote a model where production innovations happens pretty much the same way as now, and I guess most of you do, then regulation from an end user perspective is the way to go. And it might very well lead to uh, a lot of innovations that we can't foresee yet. But every choice does close the door to other options and other innovations. So forced legislation like we're seeing right now, meaning sped up, not prepared fully, is not the right way to go, uh, since neither the advocates of net neutrality nor the opponents of net neutrality actually like the current legislation. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dexe. So now it's Thomas' turn, I think. So yeah. just start. Okay. Is this loud enough? Seems to. Good. Um, yeah, I where to start? I think I'll pick up this criticism for which I'm really thankful because everybody wants to have a debate and not just preaching to the converted here. And um, the concept of net neutrality uh, has been criticized many times in literature, in um, the many texts that have been written about um, the policy approaches and the regulatory approaches to it. Um, but what's most importantly for me is the laws that are actually in place about net neutrality. And I can only encourage you to look around. La Quadrature did a great job in collecting all the, words around the, all the laws around the world uh, when it comes to net neutrality. And um, if we look at the concrete situation in a market, in the network, then it's obvious what um, a legislator has to do. Um, it's about preventing business models that are based on discrimination and based on scarcity. Um, we have to uh, make a political choice about what net neutrality, what the network is, what the internet is. If we understand the internet only as being owned by um, privatized companies or if it also has a characteristic of a um, infrastructure where the society runs, where we have education, democracy and economy happening at the same time. Um, I don't want to go into analogies. There are so many bad analogies out there when it comes to net neutrality. Um, but just briefly to come back to what uh, you said about the difficulties in enshrining net neutrality and making it concrete. We see this in particular uh, in the question of specialized services. Um, the Dutch and the Slovenian net neutrality law actually managed to make a really good uh, solution for the problems without defining specialized services. What are specialized services? These are the legitimate fast lanes, you could say, that run over the same pipes, but not necessarily our internet. And that's the crucial question. Um, do we speak only of uh, triple play products that are the classical IPTV or voice over IP? Or could it be also something like Spotify, classic online services? Their line has to be drawn, and that's the role of every legislator, no matter if they give a definition or not. But that's the question that um, we also have to ask ourselves right now, because um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the current proposal, the current regulation that is in is in this parliament negotiated right now, the telecom single market package from Commissioner Lini Cruz. Um, I don't know if you could raise hands. Are you alive? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's basically the picture that I was expecting. So, um, although we have a nice intellectual debate right now about net neutrality, um, we are currently in the end game of the political debate. Um, we have this commission proposal which is on the table, which will be voted in plenary in two weeks, and then the parliament makes its uh, position in the first reading, and it goes to the council. But uh, as many of you may know, the parliament is the only real place where, as civil society, you can put pressure on the political process in the EU. And so um, I want to go briefly into the, this proposal and uh, what we as EDRI, among many other NGOs in Europe, have done with the campaign safetyinternet.eu, where you could all go to learn more about the regulation and um, become your own lobbyist in the regards of net neutrality. Um, when you look at the timeline, Commissioner Neely Cruz, she's responsible for the digital agenda here in Europe. And um, when she took office in 2009, um, we all had very big hopes because in her first speech in the ITRI committee, in the leading industry committee, um, she said that net neutrality is the most important uh, policy goal for her uh, term and um, that for her, if an operator violates uh, net neutrality, if um, it discriminates based on commercial reasons, this is an absolute no-go for her, and this is not net neutrality. So back then, it was um, January 2010, when we were all really happy and had big hopes that the Commission finally may come up with a legislative approach to this problem, which was already spreading. Um, but then, sadly, nothing happened. Or, I mean, not nothing. There were six consultations. Uh, so six times, um, the Commission and Barrack asked for opinions uh, from several stakeholders about this issue in general, particular aspects of it, 
um, Barak looked into the numbers, what the uh, real situation is in the networks in Europe, and came back with an um, astonishing high 25% uh, in fixed line and around 50% in mobile, where operators in Europe are already violating. So 50% of all Europeans in the mobile network are already affected by net neutrality violations. So this is not a theoretical problem. We have the business model in the draw. We have many examples of products that violate net neutrality all over Europe. We have a situation where it's only a question of time before the operators will create facts. Because for them, it is a clear game. They see two trajectories. Either the internet becomes this communist approach of, you know, this basic infrastructure, the level playing field where everybody is equal, or they can introduce something which they know from the past, which they know from the world of telephony and SMS. And it's called sending party network pay in this regard. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of the basic terms of telephone regulation, but we have uh, this thing called termination fees. When, when I call you, your operator has to pay me for terminating the call. So there is money flowing in the opposite direction of the direction of the call. But as a customer, I don't care. I only care how much I have to pay when I call you. And uh, this principle has been hindering innovation and competition in the telephony world for the past decades. And now we have this same, pro this same principle being introduced in the internet in the form of sending party network pays. And how does this look like? We all have heard about it recently with the Netflix Comcast deal. Um, when I go to YouTube, when I want to watch a YouTube video, YouTube has to pay my ISP for showing me this video. It's the same basic principle. And um, the underlying cause for that is um, something called vertical integration. The internet operators see that there is a lot of money made in the over-the-top world, in the services that are um, uh, above their top, so to say, like Facebook, like Twitter, like Google, and they make a lot of money over the pipes of the operators. And the operators want to have a piece of the cake. They want to have a share of this money that's being made via the infrastructure. And therefore, they want to vertically integrate along um, the value chain. And this principle is driving the whole debate. Currently in Europe, we are in the end game, but I want to go back and briefly go into the history, if I have time. Um, the, I, I already said that uh, when Commissioner Lili Cruz came into office, we all had big hopes. Basically, nothing happened until September 2013. So only a few months back, uh, very close to the elections, the reason why you are here, um, the Commission released their regulatory approach called Telecom Single Market, which is a very broad regulatory package. It includes net neutrality, among several other things, and um, is a neatly tied up package, which is more or less everything the industry was hoping for. Um, if this package goes through, the telecom market in Europe would consolidate within a few years. Uh, we would be at a situation where the U.S. is right now, where instead of many small operators, we have only a handful of very few pan-European operators. Um, people speak of things like economy of scales. We speak of the total abolishment of competition in the infrastructure market. The only reason why a company would make long-term investments into infrastructure, into fiber, is competition. And competition would be the one thing that's not within this package. Um, there were many criticisms when the Commission finally came around uh, and releasing the proposal from within the Commission, from the DG Justice Department. Um, we as Edry leaked an internal document from them where they, um, among other things, also criticized uh, the Commission for um, so themselves for violating uh, fundamental rights because uh, the original commission proposal also included um, some big proposals about uh, voluntary measures of ISPs, so um, internet censorship. And we had also critics from BEREC, the body of European regulators of electronic communications, and uh, they basically said it would have been nice if the commission would have asked the experts before coming around with this and also the uh, European Data Protection Supervisor was uh, very firm in his criticism. 
Yeah, um, also to mention is to the, the strategy behind this proposal. Um, the Commission and Neely Cruz in particular uh, was really brilliant in tying up this package. Um, they used the elections to um, intentionally postpone this package so close to the, um, the end of this term in this parliament that there was no real time for a meaningful discussion, that all politicians are in a hurry to uh, get this through. Um, we have leaks of exactly the same regulatory text, more or less, from May 2013. So there was even the text was finished, but then they waited a few months uh, to make this time pressure even more on the parliament. Um, there were populistic elements. Uh, if you have ever read about this um, telecom single market package, it was probably in the context of roaming fee, because with this regulation, um, they also want to abolish roaming fees. And um, they also used a very bizarre and complex language when it came to the net neutrality provisions. Uh, if you read them in the first reading, you would think, okay, this sounds really great. They're really doing a good job. They're speaking about ending discrimination and equality of package. But if you read closer, there are actually many, many loopholes in the dossier. And they uh, produced around five and a half pages of text, but actually below the safety level that the Dutch and Slovenian law provide, and they are around one page. So it, it could have been done uh, much easier, which much few words, but they added so much words in order to make it more complex and um, within the time frame of the parliament very um, um, yeah, unrealistic to have any responsible political debate about it. And as a fourth category of the Commission strategy, I would add, if you have ever followed Neely Cruz or uh, her spokesperson, Ryan Heath, on Twitter, you will be aware of that, that they are shouting out very loud all the time how much in favor they are of net neutrality. But this is just the, um, <laughs> um, I want to be polite, the um, PR line surrounding this proposal. Uh, everybody is these days pro-net neutrality, uh, even the conservatives are, um, because it's like environmental issues, nobody is against sustainability, although um, the reality looks different. Um, I could go on and on, but I think I'm over my time. So, <laughs> the, yeah, so we, we had uh, the vote in the leading committee in ITRE on um, uh, this Tuesday, so it's all really fresh. Now we are uh, like two weeks away for the plenary vote, which will happen on April 3rd. Um, and we have a very bad text from the Conservative Rapporteur Pilar del Castillo, which is on the table, which uh, still contains all the loopholes that the telcos would need to implement their business model based on discrimination and scarcity. And now it's up to the Parliament and the whole Parliament to come up with a better text and to find a majority for it. That's the task at hand. And that's also why all of you come in. Because with savetheinternet.eu, we provided a campaign platform for everybody to join, to inform themselves. We have YouTube videos, we have a lot of text, we have graphics, we have everything you need to get active in this fight. Uh, you can call your parliamentarians with uh, a widget we have on this website. You can send them an email, and you can even send them a fax. That's the maybe curious Ooh, historical thing. thing about it that uh, you can send a fax to save the internet these days. So just with a click on the website, um, you can send a fax out to uh, the parliamentarian's office. And uh, faxes have two advantages. On the one hand, there are no spam filters for faxes, uh, although we from time to time get blocked by the uh, firewall of the parliament, but we circumvented that. And on the other hand, uh, faxes are um, more compatible to the generation, which is uh, yeah, not so well acquainted with the internet. Yeah, that's my call to action, and now I'm going to hand over to Caroline. Hi, so my name is Caroline de Kock. Um, I am a lobbyist. Um, I represent the Voice on the Net Coalition, which is a coalition that includes um, two big names, uh, Skype, Microsoft, and Google. Uh, believe me, running a co coalition with Microsoft and Google in it is fun in itself. Um, but, um, and also some smaller players uh, that have as a commonality that they do voice over IP and more generally uh, communications over IP on the internet. Um, I've been doing it since 2007 and I've never ceased to be amazed that big players um, 
like Skype and Google would not have the tendency to act like telcos do, as in incumbents, and just consider that net neutrality is a bad thing because it brings competition to them, and they have the deep pockets to pay for an absence of net neutrality. Um, oddly enough, my members seem to consider that, first of all, they have fond memories of the fact that they were able to innovate without permission. If uh, Google had had to call AT&T and ask, you know, can I launch my Google thing and wait for the permission of AT&T, they'd still be waiting in that garage, probably. Um, the other thing is that it's a very self, I mean, there's two very selfish reasons for protecting net neutrality um, for my members. One is, obviously, their services run uh, over the internet and depend on net neutrality being applied for those services to run properly. And also, um, big companies like Google and, and Skype actually grow and stay innovative, one, by having competitors, and two, if the competitors are really good, by buying them. Um, so if you create a model where there's only a few players that actually can pay the telcos to uh, offer their services over the internet, you don't have that pool of innovation available anymore. Um, we face a situation where um, most of the trouble uh, so far has been on mobile phones a lot more than it has been on fixed lines. Um, and it has been gradual or parallel but with peaks. So um, it all started with good old blocking. You know, that's the, you know, the real um, manly way of doing things. If you're a telco, you just, if you don't like a service, you just block it and uh, that's it. And pers people are trying to access it. They can't. And the first reaction of every user is to blame the service, not the telco. That's just a human reaction. Um, then, you know, I think some people must have said, you know, it, it really looks bad if you really block it like that. You should be slightly more subtle about it. So they started degrading. So they wouldn't block it, but they'd make it so bad by putting software sniffers in their network that dropped, uh, you know, three packets out of ten, that you would be having a conversation that went like, uh oh <laughs> and say, oh God, that Skype thing is really useless. Um, uh, I'll just pick up my phone again and do the good old copper voice thing. Um, then um, someone said, you know, it's starting to look a bit obvious that you're degrading these packets. And by the way, the other guys are obfuscating their packets now and they're claiming their packets are something else than VoIP, just to try to circumvent your software sniffers, which is a form of guerrilla war that's been going on over the internet for years now. And so they said, okay, we, we, you know, Blocking isn't that good, degrading isn't working anymore, so let's try asking for an additional fee. So basically, when you were uh, buying mobile internet, or, and actually when you're still buying mobile internet in quite a few countries, it says you are buying mobile internet, but you can't do VoIP, and if you want to do VoIP, you have to pay nine euros more uh, on top of your subscription to be able to do VoIP. So that was step three. Um, I'm not sure that was so extremely successful because they went to step four. And step four is now giving preferential treatment to certain services or applications. So basically that often works as um, you buy a mobile internet subscription, you have a data cap of let's say two gig, but certain services when you access them are not um, being considered for your data cap. So for example, uh, there was an awful thing uh, called Tempo Tribe in Belgium launched by one of the mobile operators where um, your data cap was not affected if you went to Facebook, Netlog, YouTube and Twitter I think. And it was uh, marketed as the package for the young people. I have three children. If my three children think the internet is Facebook, Netlog, Twitter and YouTube, that's an extremely sad view of life and of the internet. Um, but that's, that's the way it's been going. So it's been discrimination in all kinds of forms, but a gradual one and a more and more sophisticated one, and it's not going to end. Whatever we complain about and try to make them stop, they will find something else. And by the way, when I say Facebook netlock, I'm not even claiming these people made a deal with those telcos. In many cases, just the telco thinking, oh, that, that looks, the marketing department of the telco, that looks like a great package, let's bundle those. Um, so you enter in a situation where telcos pick winners and losers on the internet, which is the worst possible situation you can come to on the internet. Um, by the way, um, telcos always claim that you can't regulate them on the internet because you would lose innovation. Um, 
to my knowledge, the two major innovations done by telcos over the last, last years is one, IPTV, which looks pretty much like TV to me, except that it uses another protocol to get to me. Um, and, you know, there are set-up boxes that pretty much look like VCR recorders half of the time, and you can play back something afterwards. I've, I've been thinking about any other innovation that my telco brought to my home, and honestly, I haven't found one. All the innovation has come from what they call the over-the-top players, uh, which are the internet application and service providers. Um, on terminology, because we had that discussion, um, there is a very um, um, interesting terminology launched by telcos uh, about internet players. Over the top, for example. Over the top is, is, gives an impression of something that is free riding over a wave, that is surfing over it, but that is not really, um, you know, contributing to what it's riding over the top. We, we get, we've been for ages now, uh, called free riders. Skype has been called a free rider a zillion times. Google has been called a free rider. And I've never quite understood why, because um, when I meet friends and family, they never bring me to their cellar and say, do you want to look at my, my shiny broadband pipe? No one buys the services of telecoms because the pipe looks good and it's shiny and you know, there's fiber and you can stroke it. Everyone buys broadband because they want to access the internet and the services and applications that are on it. Um, I've worked for telecoms providers. I remember the days where everyone complained they had bought very, very expensive 3G licenses and that the networks were empty because no one was using them. And then suddenly people were using them and they complained like, oh my God, and they're going to use services and applications over the networks, that's really painful. That's the purpose of what they do, is giving access to the services and applications. So we're trying to um, have that fight at European level. Um, and the difficulty is you have two options. Um, you can fight it at a principal level, which is what the Netherlands did and Slovenia by adopting a law that was really short and to the point, um, but that to a certain extent then leaves it to the regulator to decide if he's going to do something with the principles at high level. Um, and the reality is, to my knowledge, Opta, the Dutch regulator, for example, has not picked any case of absence of net neutrality so far in the Netherlands, even though, to my knowledge, all of the behavior that I've described is happening in the Netherlands today. So um, the other alternative is going into a micromanagement of details um, that the Commission has proposed, which is so detailed and so confused that anyone can read anything into it and feel very happy about it or unhappy, depending. Um, you know, the good solution would have been somewhere in the middle, but looking at it from a practical point of view, we always look at it from a, if we had to complain to a regulator, does the text allow us to do so? What do we have to prove to show that a telco misbehaved and to be sure that the regulator says, yeah, I have the tools and I have the power to step in and tell the telco to stop doing whatever he's doing or she's doing. Maybe a telco could be a, a woman. We never know. Um, and that's a difficult balance. Um, I agree there are loop, loopholes in the text that is... Um, currently on the table, and that was uh, tabled by uh, the Spanish rapporteur uh, Pilar del Castillo. Uh, as a coincidence today, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says Bad Toro, but it was not intended for her. Um, but it's very difficult, honestly, to, to write text on that issue, because it's an issue where you both have to be um, technically aware and technologically neutral, which is kind of difficult to be at the same time. A um, couple of remarks on, on my on the previous speaker's comments, I don't think civil society can only put pressure on the European Parliament. Um, I think you guys can put pressure on the Council because the Council at the end of the day are the governments of the different member states. If in your member states you put pressure through elections, through protests, through writing on ministers, you can make a difference. Me as a Brussels lobbyist, I have no influence on the national ministries um, citizens that elect them, yes, they have an influence on them, and you should, not, you should never forget that. ACTA um, 
There is a trauma in Brussels about the fact that 20,000 people went out in freezing weather in Warsaw to protest about ACTA. They didn't think geeks ever came out of their houses. Oh, oh sorry. Um, they thought you all stayed behind a computer in a cellar somewhere and they would never see you, and suddenly, oops, they were there in the street protesting. So um, I think you can always, never forget the importance of civil society. It actually has more, it carries more weight than industry in some cases. Because we're in a situation where the telcos say we employ so many people and if you don't allow us to make more money and continue our inefficient models of running very old networks and sweating the assets until they die, um, you know, that's, it's going to be terrible for the European industry. And we are on the other side saying, well, you know, that's all very nice, but at the end of the day, all of the innovation has been coming from the internet and that's the one you should be preserving. Um, final word from Mahatma Gandhi um, it's kind of described my parkour on net neutrality um, by describing his own it's a bit um, um, maybe arrogant to say that but he said first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you then you win and I think that's what you should always think about when you're uh, considering doing something on net neutrality I started with them saying you, you are trying to find uh, uh, you're trying to find a problem uh, w where there is no problem. Net neutrality is not an issue. Look at the states. My God, I looked at the states. That was scary, um, you know. And, and saying all of that, market forces would, will solve it. Um, you know, there's a lot of market forces on the internet, but I haven't seen many in the telco world. And, and all of that will be solved by competition at infrastructure level, because no one would be crazy enough, obviously, to um, cut off uh, certain providers, all of them, someone would be smart enough to offer them. As Vaughan, we do, we do, uh, we've done uh, several researches on terms and conditions and in certain countries all mobile operators prohibit uh, voice over IP in their terms and conditions unless you pay a surcharge. So I don't see evidences of competition there. Thank you. Thank you all. Are there any questions from the plenum right now? Uh, I see several hands. One, two, three, four. Okay, so I think I start with the one I saw first and then we go uh, in the order that you raised them, or at least I saw them raised. So I think I start with um, the guy from the Netherlands. I've already forgotten your name again, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, so in two weeks, uh, the European Parliament will talk about and probably vote on net neutrality. How likely is it that they will pass the bills that are currently on the table and fuck up everything? Um, it's really hard to say. There are um, many things at play right now. Because uh, with the elections being so dramatically close, um, you cannot really expect politicians to behave rationally. As opposed to all the other times where they behave rationally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, but the point is, I mean, we have, uh, in this parliament, uh, we had several resolutions calling for net neutrality. Even the conservative CEPP released a paper in which they demanded the principle of net neutrality to be enshrined in European law. So um, there would be a principal willingness to, to go for it. But uh, the, the question is if they are um, thorough on the details and really um, uh, don't, don't leave uh, discrimination loopholes in the, in the final bill. And uh, that's the question of getting a good text on the table. And then the second question is um, if they can agree upon it. Uh, it sounds ridiculous, but uh, that's not for certain because um, political groups want to take ownership of this package. You have this populistic element of roaming in it, and also ACTA is still um, in the bones, so to say, so they don't want to um, yeah, fuck, fuck the internet up before the elections. Um, they are aware of that. And that's also our card, you know, um, that we can demand a solution, and a real solution, um, because if they get the impression that civil society is aware of this, that the process is watched, then this will make a dramatic difference. And 
that's again the call to action. I think really it's uh, quite effective to do something in the remaining Danes we have, no matter what it is. But uh, nationally multiplying the campaign in your own language is one of the good things you could do. Um, or also look into um, the actors. I mean, uh, all those politicians want to be re-elected uh, in only a few weeks. So um, they have open doors right now. And it's also another good way to uh, yeah, make them listen. Um, so basically, when the vote took place in the committee, there were two uh, proposals on net neutrality on the table. There was one by the rapporteur leading uh, and represented conservatives, and one uh, proposed by, um, jointly by S&D and the Greens, um, and more specifically, Amelia and Ozotter uh, within the Green faction from the Pirate Party. And with a very uh, small majority, um, the, the um, version of Del Castillo passed. And I insist on that small major majority. It was extremely tight. Um, when we go to plenary uh, in two weeks' time, on the 3rd of April, there will be the vote. Mark your calendars. Um, actually, mark your calendars on the 2nd of April. That's when you need to phone. Um, at that time, uh, the, um, those two proposals slightly changed will be on the table probably again. Um, and at the end of the day, the liberals will be the tipping point that takes it in one direction or another. Um, if I can give you an advice, that there, there is a, a nice rapporteur called Mr. Jens Rode. Um, I don't think you're going to influence him because he thinks roaming is the most important thing in life. Um, which I can understand because he travels in different countries and probably has to pay a big bill and sees an immediate benefit for himself to, to that. And also from a, I don't know, it's been, it's been already two commissions. I saw Barroso 1 and Barroso 2 and their biggest victories in the digital age in both cases will be roaming, which is kind of a sad way of looking at life, but it's a way, I guess. Um, above that, Mr. Rode, there's someone called Guy Verhofstadt, who is the leader of the ALDE faction, who happens to be Belgian, uh, a nice gentleman. I would encourage you to write directly to him and ask for the ALDE faction to do the right thing and preserve the open internet. Um, I think we're at that stage where we just need to tell them, it, it, it looks, for a lot of MEPs, it looks like just a few words difference, but those words actually make a difference and they need to be made aware of it. Thank you. We don't do Europe. <laughs> okay, then we get to the second question, the girl in the third row. Okay. Um, well, I have uh, two que questions. Uh, the first question is, um, of course, we have lobbying from uh, the side of the providers, but we also are in uh, the strange situation that we have also lobbying from, uh, uh, bi from big enterprises like Google, so uh, you, re you represent them. Um, so uh, if, the if the provider bring up the arguments uh, of uh, closing down um, uh, uh, working opportunities and so on, um, perhaps Google and uh, uh, Microsoft, etc., could do the same. Um, so uh, that's the first question. So it is in, uh, so it's like beating fire with fire. And uh, the second question is: um, We are in a situation in which uh, politics react very slow, and of course there is a third side. Um, we had we ha we had so taking uh, the problem problem in our own hands. We had uh, the same problem with uh, the NSA, where taking it in our own hands would be using uh, crypto. In this, uh, in this way, we could uh, just say, um, if the pro provider cannot see the uh, uh, metadata, so um, the, uh, for example, uh, uh, if we use a VPN, and uh, if we use a VPN that uh, goes to, I don't know, to Sweden or to our university or wherever, we can uh, use a technical solution 
to make uh, uh, to make sure that the provider does not see uh, who I am communicating with. So these are my two questions. Uh, is that possible? Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm afraid that internet companies, I'm not going to talk about Microsoft, the Skype side of Microsoft has very few employees. They're now merged with Microsoft, but um, I'm not sure Microsoft has completely gathered that Skype is saying what they're saying on net neutrality. Um, <laughs> on, on, on the Google, you can't imagine the number of people that a Deutsche Telekom employs. It's in the hundreds of thousands. Not sure what all these people do. Quite honestly, I, mean, I think they drive around with little cars and repair cables and things like that. But I mean, the, 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 the scale is very different to their advantage. And in some countries, they, by the way, the government is still a shareholder of the telecoms incumbent, which makes it you know, slightly more difficult because you're not only talking to the telecoms ministry, you're also talking to the finance minister who's thinking about money and di dividends. So um, that, that, that's one thing. I mean, and to a certain extent, I find it a very, um, um, how should I say it, I find it a very cheap argument by the telcos because at the end of the day, if they try to be very good at what they should be doing, which is provide top-notch infrastructure, these people would not, not need to be fired or lose their job. They would just have a telco that concentrates on being the best pipe there is instead of trying to stop all the people using the pipe that could compete with something they might be doing one day. So. I, I prefer to stay at the principal level of, of, of you know, making sure that the streets out there, um, uh, it's not the guy that built the street that decides which trucks go on it or which cars go on it. Um, that's the one, your second question was about... Um, um, VPN and circumventing. Yeah, I mean, it, there, there, are, there are multiple ways of, of circumventing. It all depends how deep their packet inspection will go and if they will just take the, the you know, if, if the traffic shaping is going to be that they block anything they can't inspect, yes. you, you might not get there. Um, the problem is just knowledge of people. You know, my mom doesn't know what a VPN is, quite honestly. She, my mom only discovered Skype a couple of years ago and, you know, she likes it because she can talk to her granddaughter with it. So it's, you know, some of the tools are really cool, but they need to be embedded by nature in everyone's computer because a lot of the users won't be able to find them or understand them. Uh, so I, it, it can save some, but not all. I just have a very short comment. And when you look at the lobbying being done here, um, I know that pirates are usually very skeptic against large corporations that deal with the internet, but sometimes it's also worth picking your battles. In, in, the, in the context of net neutrality, the interests of Google and Skype and Microsoft perfectly align with the usual approach of net neutrality. Sometimes Google and other corporations do things that pirates or people who want a more open internet might disagree with, but sometimes they also do good things. And that goes for a lot of different other lobbyists as well. It's not all bad. You can always see some uh, grain of uh, good argumentation. Yeah, also just two sh small things to, to, to the questions of yours. Um, we actually looked at that in um, our efforts to convince uh, particularly the liberals and According to the Commission's own figures, um, there are more people employed in SMEs than in the big corporations in the IT sector. It's 56% of the um, total employment in the EU27, which are actually the small companies in the information and communication sector. So I wouldn't necessarily agree that the big companies, the incumbents that are too big to fail, are also the ones that provide the most jobs, particularly if you look down at um, the meat of the IT economy, um, of the startup economy, and uh, where the real innovation is happening. And uh, to the other questions about VPN and circumventing um, net neutrality violations or whatever type of categorization the ISP is doing, um, these are at best battles for retrieval. Um, we, the elite, the people who can use a shell, may be able to circumvent things. Um, it's the same as internet censorship or copyright stuff. But that's not the political approach uh, we should look at because it's really about finding solutions for all of Europe, 
for all 500 million people. And we have to come up with solutions that also um, are in line with the character of the internet. I mean, we're speaking about something which is now in our computers, maybe in a few years, in our bodies. So the internet is a basic infrastructure that has to be kept open. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for me too. There were more questions, I think, in this direction. Do you still have a question? Yeah, and when you start with on the right side with the guy with the number 20, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm not comfortable to, to be uh, a referee uh, for a match between telcos and the big ones, huh? too big to fail. So I would ask you the question, as a citizen, it's very difficult to me to to have this hat, so it's, it's for me to decide. Huh? They, they should decide themselves, I think. So if, if the big companies and telcos should not, are not able to find a solution themselves, uh, what do you think about the worst solution that I, citizen or the politician, will say, okay, telcos, you become public. Huh? Telco is no more company that will be public service or civil service. And you, the big ones, you will pay taxes on, on data, or on, on circulation, and so on. So uh, what do you think about the worst solution if a good solution is not, not fine? Um, if I understood your question correctly, it's about um, more or less um, taking a step back in history and reversing um, or taking the privatization back of the um, formerly state on telephone companies. Um, that's maybe too extreme, but it goes in the right direction, I'm personally speaking here. But I think the concept of functional separation uh, is one that we should very much look into. To separate the infrastructure from the companies that provide the access service over it. Um, there are many good examples for that in Sweden. Um, it has been discussed in the 2009 telecoms package, but sadly it was um, not the direction the legislator took. Um, but in principle, I think that is only um, being fruitful for the role the Internet plays these days. It is um, indistinguishable from, from water, electricity or streets. And there is a certain public character that you want to safeguard from, from the competition element. But at the same time, we know that um, public bodies are not the most efficient when it comes to running things. So um, if you could separate those, uh, and we often have this in the electricity market already, that you have one company, could be privately owned, could be public owned, but it has guidelines that only cares about the infrastructure, uh, that looks that you have good infrastructure everywhere where all public funding that goes into this company also goes into um, um, having top-notch infrastructure. And uh, then you have other companies that make wholesale over those pipes and um, they can go bankrupt. They can have real competition and uh, they sell you the internet access and the IP. Um, this would be also good for the net neutrality debate overall because competition and um, quoting Neely Cruz from the early days here, could be a solution for net neutrality. In the current situation, this is absolutely not true. If we would move toward a functional separation scenario, it could become a bit more true. Um, who, who will pay for the public service? Um, the, the, the other half of my question. Yeah. Um, uh, it's tricky to answer always. I mean, um, in these days, if you say um, the public should pay, the state should pay, um, yeah, you, you get stoned. But, um, I mean, you could finance it with bonds. If you give long-term investment um, bonds that are um, secured by uh, the state and its credibility and uh, that have a fixed um, interest rate, and you only invest in the infrastructure. That would be one way of uh, getting money into the system, but there are actually also a lot of things you could do without spending any money at all, because if we would have, uh, you could particularly go on a community and regional level for that, um, you could just make rules that whatever somebody is uh, using uh, the right of, of ways to have access to um, any geographical instance that they are obliged to put fiber cables in there. 
And so um, the, the most expensive stuff and the most expensive part of uh, distributing infrastructure widespread is uh, to opening up the ground and getting the fiber in the ground. And uh, if you would just take care of the fact that, um, if you just make certain that whenever um, somebody digs a hole, they have to put a fiber line in there, um, slowly and slowly you would come up uh, with really good infrastructure. And there's just no way against this, uh, no good argument against this, I would say. Um, just to add, in, in the UK, British Telecom was split up um, a couple of years ago. And so basically they separated the, the last mile, the access bit, which is a kind of a natural bottleneck because no one's going to get three um, telecoms cables to come all the way to their home. Um, so they split up that with the rest of the services and, uh, of BT. BT is not at all, has no governmental share, it's a private company. And you create a situation where that, that last mile entity that's just supposed to give the same products and the same access to everyone asking for it at, at the same price under the same conditions, um, that is a lovely bottleneck that is very um, 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 attractive to people that want to do long-term investments. They're basically the only guys getting in the house anyway. If you're not in a hurry to get your investment back, put money into it, you're pretty sure to get your investment back again. So that didn't require any taxpayers' money or anything. They just created an entity that was extremely attractive uh, for long-term investors. So the, the dichotomy that telecoms operators now have by being one big vertically integrated structure is they have parts of their uh, company that would like to have quick returns of investment and is trying to talk to the stock market every quarter. And they have parts of their uh, business that are long-term investments. It's very difficult to handle as a company and, and to understand. Um, also, the people that run the access infrastructure when it's vertically integrated, on the one hand, they have colleagues asking for access, and on the other hand, they have competitors to their colleagues asking for access. Imagine in what situation that puts you and how nice you would be to those competitors. So, so the separation is possible without um, enduring, um, uh, creating a lot of burden on citizens. At the end of the day, all the players that are on the internet at present pay for it. Consumers pay for an internet subscription to access to the internet, and the service and application providers pay to put their services and applications on the internet. If they're huge like Google, they pay for CDNs and all kinds of things. Everyone is paying, and the telco is being paid for offering that access to the internet. So I, it's just a question that the, when the British Telecom did it, everyone said it's going to cost a lot, it's going to be very complicated, it's going to take ages. And honestly, I have no impression that suddenly, you know, um, the UK stopped uh, having a communications network. Actually, the broadband has improved dramatically over the past years since that split. Okay, then there was another question, please. Thank you. Uh, Alex from Pirate Party, Romania. Um, okay, telcos are clearly not the good guys, so let's go a bit more in the game of what if. Suppose, supposedly telcos get their own way, it goes, um, well, kind of bad for us. Um, we know that Google is starting to put its own fiber, being, starting to become a little bit the operator itself. Uh, we've heard rumors about Facebook doing that. Do you think if it would go Telco's way, um, service companies like Google, Facebook and others could retaliate in a practical way by becoming um, operators themselves? Um, yeah, Google is, is, is doing things in Kansas. Um, let's be <laughs> it's far away from here. Um, and and um, I'm not saying Google wouldn't do anything in Europe, but when you look at Europe, you're looking at 28 member states. You're not looking at the same geographical uh, make as you would uh, in the States. Um, could Google do something? Um, I honestly hope so. It would be nice to have a bit more competition in Europe. Um, um, but the, the, the requirements and the framework as it is at the moment makes me think that it's not their priority uh, as such. I also think their trials in the, in the States were less about them being a competitor to the telco than about them proving 
that you can do funky stuff with fiber and it, that, that doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. And maybe breathing down the neck of the telco slightly, just slightly. But um, so would they come to Europe? Yeah, eventually I think they would, although I can't speak for Google and they don't you know, share board secrets with me. Um, will it be in any due time that would um, allow us to, um, you know, put the pieces together after a lost net neutrality battle? I'm afraid not. I mean, getting a license, opening, opening pavements in Europe is a very, very, very painful thing. Um, let's just have one thing in mind here as well, that the telcos are not evil. They work at a business logic. Uh, they're not over the board, uh, regulating everything they can and throttling every single application. It's, there are some that don't do that at all and make an active stance. Um, it, it's, it's a market logic that you can do this and therefore corporations will do it. Um, so it's not a strange and it's not an evil thing. It just happens. And when there are bottlenecks on the market, Usually there will be other parts of the market that pop up and try to fix that bottleneck. If it's another infrastructure or if it's another thing, that's a whole different story. But I am pretty certain that if the telcos fuck up in a major way, someone will come and do something else. Um, I don't think that Google needs to put in fiber anywhere to um, achieve their goals. Um, if you look at what they are doing in the Global South, you get a pretty clear picture of what I think is their long-term plan for um, handling the, 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 the access markets and the layers below them. And um, these examples are Google Free Zones in Africa, where you are in most areas where you have no real internet or no uh, significant share of the population that could... Um, pay for internet, for really internet access, then they have these free zones where with certain handsets uh, you can access um, all Google services or a set of Google services. Um, you can give them your data and uh, you can even search and you can click one link deep into the World Wide Web, but not, below, not after that. So it's really like a nice vault garden. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the access model, uh, and Facebook is doing the same with um, Facebook Zero, uh, which is also in Europe. And uh, if you look at internet.org, uh, the new patch project of Mark Zuckerberg, um, you can go to the website and watch uh, his, his video there. You'll get a pretty uh, clear picture of what they are planning to do. And um, it's no surprise, and it was not... Um, and a mistake or a, an accident that he was speaking at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona a few weeks ago. So their plan definitely is to, to vertically integrate um, with the access provider and with the handset um, operators and manufacturers. And um, we, we have to be aware of that because, I mean, particularly in the Global South where you don't have um, um, developed um, telecoms market, um, destroying net neutrality there will be even more disastrous and will even have more bad long-term effects. And so the question is really uh, for Europe now, um, for the Global South and also for um, the US, if we can set a standard in the question of net neutrality, it's very similar to data protection. If we don't come up with good balanced solutions, then um, it will be hard for, for the overall development. Okay, I, I think just one last question because the time is almost up. Um, who has got a, tr uh, I'm taking the guy over there, yes, you. <laughs> is, um, one I know that it was discussed, but it sort of went over my head, so what is, Policy-wise, what, what are the difference between the Pilar Castillo draft on the connected content regulation and the draft submitted by Amelia, and why do they matter? If I, I realize that it's complex, but if you could dumb it down to someone who doesn't have. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm now opening the uh, PDF that Adri released exactly to answer this question. And you can also find it on safetyinternet.eu. We have a comparison of the two competing compromise amendments from ITRE. And there you can see um, the diff, so to say, with our annotations between Castillo and Troutman. And in basic, you have um, only in the Troutman and understood the version binding net neutrality in Article uh, 214, where they define internet access. Um, Troutman and, and understood uh, uh, added the text in accordance with the principle of net neutrality. And that makes the definition of recital 45 binding. So only in them, in their draft, they have actually put net neutrality in the bill. Um, you see EPP running around and saying, we are for net neutrality, but they're not saying that it's only in the recital and that means it's non-binding and ISPs don't have to care. And on an even more crucial and, and, and a bit more complex question, it's about the definition of specialized services. Um, Dartman and Anderstott uh, put the uh, functionally identical provision in there, which um, has been heavily debated. And basically it says that a specialized service um, is not supposed to be any existing online services. So that's exactly the red line that you have in um, the Slovenian net neutrality law, for example, as well, that if you sell internet access and you sell anything else besides that, it cannot be a service that's already in the same internet access. So you want to prevent existing online services becoming a specialized service because if they are um, able to be um, offered via best effort internet, then there's just no reason for them to be a specialized service except an unfair competition advantage. Um, these are the two main differences. Um, and yeah, they both have one fatal mistake. And um, Dortmund and, and uh, also understood the art to, um, yeah, to change that and to fix that for the plenary. Um, in Article 23.5, they both basically say that outside of your data cap, you can discriminate. So if you have uh, 200 megabytes per month and um, half of the month has passed, uh, then your internet connection is throttled down to like 64K. Um, the provider would have the possibility to uh, still offer certain services, partner services or his own services in the normal speed. And uh, that's a crucial point because that's exactly what Deutsche Telekom was proposing um, with their shift to have um, Spotify is one example that already exists, but it, they also wanted to extend this to the fixed line market and have data caps there. Um, because that neatly ties into the specialized service debate. And it's the same principle of sending party network pays that somebody has to pay the bill, and either it's the customer or it's the service provider. And um, we have to fix that because net neutrality has to um, also catch those who are outside of their data caps. If you throttle, then you have to throttle everything. Okay, so we have finished with the questions. Maybe the three participants um, want to give a last statement um, on the topic of net neutrality. I would start with um, Dexa. Do you have to say something uh, to everyone at last? I, I can just reiterate my uh, original point uh, or original argument that Net neutrality as a principle is about regulating the internet from an end user perspective. It's not neutral, it's a regulation. Uh, that's not a bad thing, but you should keep in mind that there are different perspectives when you talk about political issues and keep an open mind to those different perspectives. Um, I'll just uh, follow up on what you just said and um, would, would extend the point with some agency, I think uh, what's often overlooked is the role of national regulatory authorities and also the European umbrella organization of those regulatory authorities, BEREC. Um, these guys are the ones who actually um, make sure that net neutrality is obliged, no matter if you have a law or not. They have a lot of power and they translate um, the policy towards the market and the technological reality, and both ways. 
They are also gathering data and um, explaining the technical and market realities to the politicians. So in every net neutrality scenario, no matter how the vote will go on April 3rd, NRAs are a very important institution um, and we have to make sure that they do a good job. This is not an easy question. Um, but I think also in particular in the question of BEREC, um, we have to make sure that this agency stays open because they have done a great job in making sure that we have a meaningful debate in Europe which is um, on a quite um, high expert level and the populism only came later from the Commission and uh, therefore we need to make certain that this agency stays uh, independent and um, the expert organizations as we know them. Um, so for me, when I look at net neutrality, it's about two things. Um, it's about one, all of you, me as a consumer, being the one that chooses the winners and the losers. It's about me being able to change if I don't like a service on the internet with a snap of a finger and without having to contact my telco and change my bundle. It's about me not having to go in a cable TV situation when I'm on the internet where I receive a basic service and have to buy bouquets of sports and children entertainment. So that's one side. The other side is um, it's about entrepreneurship. It's about, you know, my kids um, having 10 euros, being able to buy a domain name, being able to do something and maybe becoming the next Google out of Brussels. That's not very likely, but who knows. Um, but basically about um, having that freedom to innovate at any given time with very few means and having the world at your feet. I always say that if we enter into a situation where the telcos can negotiate with every service provider and every application provider if their services are going to get through, that means that the first person that every startup will have to hire is a lawyer, not an engineer not a developer, a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. That's a sad thing for a startup if they start by hiring me. So um, that's what net neutrality is about and that's what you guys should be working on uh, preserving. Thank you. Can I make a short announcement? Uh, we just uh, received the information that the European Court of Justice will rule on data retention, the data retention regulation on April 8. April is a busy month. Thank you very much, all three of you, Jacob, Thomas and Caroline, for your participation and interesting insights into net neutrality. And I hope you still have some more fun and interesting discussions on the rest of the conference. Yes, and everyone else as well, hopefully. So now um, the next panel will soon start, I think, as I see the organizer already <laughs> waiting for me to finish. Okay, so bye.